Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm joined on the podcast today by Wall Street Journal, Amazon Charts, and Washington Post bestselling author Brianna Labuskis. Brianna writes psychological thrillers and historical fiction. Her latest novel is The Librarian of Burned Books. Author Elise Hooper wrote about Brianna's new novel, The Librarian of Burned Books is a thoroughly engrossing page-turner that proves how powerful words and ideas can be, no matter the era. Filled with intrigue and secrets, this timely novel follows three women from Berlin to Paris to New York City to right past wrongs using books as their weapon of choice. Brianna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, The Librarian of Burned Books, how would you describe the novel? Sure. Yeah, I would describe it as um, an underdog fight (laughs) against a powerful senator trying to enact a censorship um, bill on these books called the Armed Services Editions, which were sent to soldiers serving overseas by the millions. Um, They were this kind of light in the dark for these men who are so bored and terrified at the same time. And um, the senator wanted to kind of had a political agenda, so he wanted to cripple the program, essentially. Um, And so the pulse beat of the novel is this censorship fight between the council, which put out the armed services editions, and the senator. But then there's also more storyline in from the 30s. Um, I don't think you can write about burned books without talking about uh, Berlin 1933. So there's a storyline that follows an American writer who went over there um, during that time period. And then there were these libraries that I discovered in my research that existed essentially to protect these books and and offer access to these books that the Nazis wanted to burn. And so I really wanted to highlight those as well. So there's a storyline for that. And they all come together in the end. (laughs) And and I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing the library in a burn books? I do. Yeah. I was just, I am such a World War II nerd. Like I just listened on my off time to World War II podcasts and books and stuff. And so I was listening to an audio book called When Books Went to War by Molly Guptal Manning. And um, it was all about not just the armed services editions, but their predecessor um, and just this whole big effort of using books as a morale booster for war. But I found this. Um, fight, the censorship fight to be so (laughs) relevant and timely to what we're going through right now. And so it just really resonated with me. Um, And so I knew I had to make that a storyline. And then after that, you start kind of building out, oh, well, I also want to talk about the burn books in Berlin. And I want to talk about these libraries. And so just kind of spawned out from there. But yeah, the impetus was from this nonfiction book this book about, you know, the power of books and war. And it just took off for me, like lit up all these light bulbs. <laughs> and, and I'm curious, what did you learn as you researched these armed services editions? Oh my gosh. It was that, the, was that the name? Yes, of you got it word? right. Armed yeah, services yeah. editions, okay. which is so interesting <laughs> because like I said, I, I pay attention to a lot of things about books in world war two, and I had never heard of these things before. Um, and it was, you know, there's so many avenues to go down. One of the more intriguing ones is that, you know, in the 30s, everything was hardbacks um, and very expensive. <laughs> and um, and obviously they can't send hardbacks overseas to the boys. That's just the logistics aren't, you know, <laughs> doable there. And so they had to create and be innovative in this industry that's kind of steeped in prestige and a little bit of snobbery and and tradition, and they just had to make it work. And so they created these paperbacks um, that were really sort of revolutionary. They were on a wave anyway. So I don't wanna I, I don't wanna give them outsized um, influence because of the paper shortages. Everyone was kind of turning to paperbacks anyways. But they really created um, they kind of removed the stigma from paperbacks because at the time they were, you know, 
they, they were thought of as inherently trashy to not to be too frank, but um, that was their reputation. And like booksellers wouldn't even put them into their sure. windows, et cetera. And um, and then they sent these paperbacks to these millions of of men who might not have even read a book cover to cover since school. Like they said that in their letters, like I haven't read a book before um, in its totality without being forced. And they created this generation of readers um, and they came back and they want to do paperbacks. And so you really get this more um, democratic access to these books. And like, that's what we were fighting for. Right. So it's kind of a cool story that maybe is a little bit buried um, in the past. I, I I was thrilled to have found it. And and I'm curious, the, the censorship committee, is that based in, in fact? Yeah. So, um, so the Council on Books and Wartime is kind of this nonprofit organization of librarians and booksellers and industry professionals. And they worked in partnership with the, um, with the Army and Navy to send these books out. And um, they were allowed to select whatever books they wanted to. They thought were appropriate for the men to read. It was like a very wide range, which I think was great um, because then they, you know, the the men had a lot of uh, options to choose from. And then Taft, so there's, um, <laughs> get into the weeds a little bit, but there was a, a voting legislation that was passing because like a tiny amount of soldiers voted during the, before the 44 election. Um, and everyone was like, <laughs> we need to fix this. And so they had this legislation that must pass. They, um, everyone's going to vote on it. So of course, you know, you see in politics, increasingly even today, is people will put their pet projects into this bill because, you know, they, they know it's going to pass. And so Taft decided, and this is a real person. He was related to the president Taft. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think he was his cousin. Um, and he decided like, this is such a popular program that the armed services editions for Roosevelt that I'm just going to try to, you know, cripple it essentially. And so he added this amendment and I, and the council was, you know, <laughs> this is the exact opposite of what we're, we stand for. Their mission was to use books in this war of ideas that the Nazis had started. And so they kind of came out, they did come out swinging. So I gave all of the storyline to Viv, like as one person, the, um, the character who is the fighting as a, as the publicist, but they did do opinions and editorials and newspapers. They reached out to the general public to try to sway public opinion. Um, they reached out to Taft a lot. Um, and so they did wage this like <laughs> six month war essentially to get him to change his mind about this opinion or um, amendment. And I feel like it'll be a spoiler, so I won't say the ending, but you, sure, ha you can sure. look it up. <laughs> it sure. did happen. So was, was there a specific title that he focused on or, 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 or um, a selection of books? Yeah. So his, um, his amendment in theory on its face was targeting quote unquote political propaganda. And so what he, his argument was, he didn't want taxpayer money to go to funding Roosevelt's fourth term campaign, <laughs> um, which, again, all seems very fair. You're like, yes. But his amendment was so overreaching that everything started to get swept into it. And so they would, um, as they were fighting this battle, they would go through and they would do lists of the books that were going to get censored because of this amendment. And it was literally like the army training manual <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, you know, Tom Sawyer and just like anything that was even, you know, politics touches on everything. And so you can make an argument that anything is political. There was a, something that got censored was a picture of Roosevelt and I identified him as the president. <laughs> and they were like, well, we can't do that. Because then there's this, there was a huge fine involved. I think there was jail time threatened. Um, like there was, it was, it had some meat to it, this legislation. And so the army was like, we're going to not, we're not going to censor books because that sends a bad message. Like they weren't, the, one of the options was to like maybe cut pages out of books. But then they're like, well, the <laughs> again, like this is what we're fi we're fighting fascists who are doing this. And we're telling the men that they're fighting this war to 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 protect a country that values freedom of speech, that values 
freedom of thought and expression. And then we're going to send them books that we've cut pages out of. Um, so they decide not to do that. And so it was just going to be really like all of these books that were just, I mean, the almanac, <laughs> like anything, almost anything that you could think of was going to uh, get swept up. There was a quote from one of the board members, the council members, and they were like, we're going to be left sending the boys the Bobsy twins and the Bible, maybe. Like, those were like their two options that were left. Um, and so it was, it was on its face. And this is what usually happens. It's like on its face, it was like a legitimate effort. Um, but it was so steeped in political agenda that it ended up being just as sweeping as possible. Sure. Venture X from Capital One is the travel card for people always asking, where next? You earn 10x miles on hotels and rental cars and 5x miles on flights booked through Capital One Travel and 2x miles on everything else you buy with Venture X. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Well, well, given your your research and your writing this novel, which is based in historical fact and research, I'm curious, what are your thoughts? Um, because it, it, it does eerily parallel what's going on today, almost 100 years later. Um, if you're talking about the 1930s, I mean, we're almost there 100 years later. And, you know, the latest headlines, which, you know, to me, as someone who champions books and reading – are just tragic where you have Florida teachers and public schools removing thousands of books from the classrooms and school libraries. I'm curious, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I it's horrifying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, um, I, so I came up with this idea in 2020 and it wasn't quite at the fever pitch we are right now. Um, but everything is so Everything is so predictable, you know, like the beats of history just come back around a lot. Um, humans are always going to be humans for better or worse. Um, and so you could kind of see where it was going. And um, and it was there's not, it's not even just the same. Oh, like we're going to ban books. It's like we're going to target um you know, queer voices and minority voices and and all of this backlash against progressivism was reflected in what was happening in 33 Berlin. Um, they were having this, you know, thriving queer community in Berlin. And um, that was the first institute where they raided it um, in May before the book burnings was this institute that studied um, gender and women's health and queerness in, in general. Um, and so the parallels are not just... Um, you know, weak parallels. <laughs> They're like exactly <laughs> what's happening. And so it's it's very scary. I also think um, one of the things to remember is it wasn't just the Nazis who's, who burned books. Like this censorship effort from Taft um, goes to show you, uh, uh, like <laughs> Americans were, ban were banning books at that time too, even though it was deeply unpopular. It was deeply taboo in terms of the propaganda that, that that Americans were being fed. I mean, there's tons of propaganda posters going around in the United States that were like, you know, the fascists burn books. We don't burn books. Um, and so the sentiment at the time was just, you know, banning is terrible. And yet, not only do you have Taft with the censorship amendment, but... Um, Another example is a book called Strange Fruit was being banned in Boston <laughs> and Detroit, and they tried to ban it from getting shipped through the mail. This was in 1944 um, <laughs> while we were fighting fascist banning books. And so I think one of the things to remember is that, you know, there can be deep sentiment against it. Um, I, you see that today, poll after poll, Americans do not want books to be banned. Um, I think it's 70% even with schools and then it jumps up to ten, like 85% with um, regular libraries. Like that is, <laughs> that's a lot of people agreeing on something and we don't really have a country that agrees on a lot. Um, and yet still it's happening. And so I think uh, 
it it does re- to reflect the fact that maybe this isn't popular, but a few really loud voices are going to have a lot of outsized influence. And the same thing happened has been happening through history. And so I don't know what to do about it <laughs> other than write a book. But um, <laughs> right. uh, I I do see so many of the same the same beats uh, coming back again. Sure. Well, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? So I was um, a journalist for a really long time. I guess not a really long time, but for about 15 years. Um, and I worked in D.C. Jour- like political journalism. And so um, <laughs> I, 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 I have a lot of uh, experience with this uh, pl- these political games, essentially. Um, And then I think it's really fun to cover that kind of stuff when you're in your 20s. Um, But then, (laughs) but then, uh, you know, each budgetary deadline that they push to Christmas Eve at midnight is like, all right, (laughs) in your 30s, it's not as fun. So um, I started as kind of, I was like, I'm just going to try writing something different, try to get, you know, shift shift a little bit. Um, and so I actually started with thrill. Well, I started with a, a, a pure romance. Um, and then I did a small press with that and I just kind of really liked, right. I was like, Oh, I can write books. And, uh, and so I moved to thrillers. And so I have about seven thrillers published and then, um, you know, I had time. So it was like, what else am I going to do? And I love history so much. It was what I was excited about. It was what I was reading in my spare time. And so I thought, why Why don't I try to write about World War II? I love it so much. And I really am super interested in that 30s, <laughs> that time in the 30s where the world is really shifting really quickly. Um, and so, yeah, this idea kind of came together in the same moment that I was kind of allowing myself to think about writing historical fiction. So it all kind of feels like the angels were singing or whatever. <laughs> sure. Well, what was your writing process when you were working on the library in a burned books, given that it is based on um, historical fact? Um, are you someone who outlines extensively before you begin writing? How does that work for you? No, I'm a pan- I'm like such a pantser. It's crazy. Um, I always say my first draft is like a really extensive outline. I um I never hold myself to it, but I always, my first draft is me telling myself the story. Um, and so I just sat down and I wrote each, a chapter of each of the characters and then just kind of the story flowed out from there. Um, and then, you know, I have, I read it, I send it to my agent who has an excellent editorial eye and, um, She's like, this isn't working. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so once you read the book, um, there's three main, there's three characters and their stories kind of interweave. And my first draft was like one, two, three, like Viv, Althea, Hannah, Viv, Althea, Hannah. And that's how I told the story. Um, and she's like, you just keep losing the pulse of the story. Um, and so I ended up kind of rearranging the chapters a little bit to make the censorship fight the driving the driving force of the book to move the plot forward, which was such a smart choice. Um, So you're not like starting and stopping every, every chapter. Um, And so there's just that kind of like rear, I'm such a rearranger. So, you know, I, I write it, but then I never, I never label my chapter numbers until the very last draft before I send to my editor, because I just move them around so much. They're almost like, little Jenga pieces or Tetris pieces. That's better. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was just kind of, it's like messy. And then I just polish and polish and polish and polish. Um, that's kind of my process. That's great. Well, are you working on a new novel now? I just turned in the second, my second historical fiction. Um, and it was, sorry, that's my dog. Um, and it's about um, the protests a protest in Berlin that was the only mass protest against the deportation of Jewish citizens. And it was successful. Um, and so it kind of ha- follows a little bit of the same framework. I really like weaving stories together. That's how I like enjoy telling stories. Um, and so there's three characters and all of their stories intertwine. Um, but the driving force is this protest, this one week long protest in Berlin um, that I found really that moving. Great. Yeah. I, 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 
I like to kind of like my favorite thing about historical fiction is how it reflect can reflect what's going on today and the ways that we can look at it. So, you know, protests, I think, have have really been having a moment in the last couple of years. um, And I really liked being able to reflect the importance of protesting under a regime, even if that even if you benefit from it. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there's so much. Um, I would say, you know, write as much as you can, like as much as if you can write daily, that's great. I think that's a really intimidating advice. It's really intimidating advice. Um because a lot of people can't, and that's totally fine, um, whether for, you know, schedule reasons or mental health reasons or what have you. But I do, I do think writing is a muscle and it's really easy not to write. <laughs> it's really easy to do like anything other than writing because it kind of tigers out your brain. Um, so even if you can get like 50 words, even like a week, 50 to 100 words a week, um, you're really going to see, be able to um, see a difference in how you're able to write. I, I've been writing some um, nonfiction essays for the librarian's release, and it is funny, not funny, but it's wild how much my nonfiction muscles have atrophied. It takes me like three days <laughs> to write like 500 words, and I write about three to 4,000 a day, usually um, for fiction. And I go back to my whatever I'm working on fiction, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's such a relief. Um, and so I do, I actually think that kind of uh, drives home my point. I'm just, I write every day. So it just is, comes a lot more natural. And so when you, when you don't, it's a harder. And so anytime anything's even harder, you're going to have a harder barrier. And so be gentle with yourself, of course, um, but also push yourself a little bit. And if pushing yourself a little bit, like again, means 50 words a week, that's what it means. Um, it's just, just trying to get yourself into a routine, I think. That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, that's always a question. And every time it's like, I forget that I've like ever heard of a book before. Um, (laughs) 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 Um, Let me see. Um, What did I just read? That was amazing. Oh, oh my gosh. I just finished The House of Eve by Sadiqa Johnson. Um, And it's this beautiful... uh, book following two black women in 1950s and um pregnancies and forced adoptions which i don't think is a spoiler um and just like what that meant for women pre-row um and just gorgeous writing and i highly recommend it that's great. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novel? Yeah, so I'm at briannalabuskis.com, um, which pretty much is, I have a very unique name. <laughs> so if you search <laughs> me, a lot of stuff will come up. But um, that's kind of where you'll be able to see uh, all the books and links to social media. And I love hearing from readers and all that stuff. So um, absolutely reach out and connect to me through there. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking to to Brianna Labuskis, author of the new novel, The Librarian of Burned Books. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Brianna, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing Slash to be in your band. Next up for lead guitar. You're in. Cool. (laughs) Yep, even easier than that. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One and a member FDIC.